<laughs> oh hi there welcome to my channel my name is Leah and today is Tuesday so that means it is time for get ready with murder this is a weekly series I do on my channel where I will do a full face of makeup and tell you a true crime story today we are going to talk about the story of Daniel LaPlante and the twists and turns that happened in his early life so if you want to see how I did this makeup and hear a crazy story make sure to stay tuned All right, I hope you guys are ready for this one. It's gonna be a little bit nuts. Um, as usual, I am just gonna show you the products that I'm using and just really stick to the story and what I'm saying. Okay, so Daniel LaPlante was born in 1970 in Massachusetts. Um, he came from a pretty rough home. His dad was very, very abusive, mentally, physically, and sexually. So he kind of started out with a really rough hand that he was dealt. On top of all that, he had problems in school. Um, he was dyslexic, so he didn't, you know, do well academically. Um, because of his home life, he didn't really fit in at school. He was kind of labeled as like a creepy or a weird kid. And then by the time he got to high school, he was actually uh, referred to the school psychologist because of his um, just lack of wanting to take care of himself. Like he did not practice any sort of good hygiene um, and just like had no social skills. So he was referred to the school psychologist at that point um, and actually diagnosed with attention hyperactivity disorder. And then to make matters worse, his psychologist um, had like, they had a working relationship for a few years while he was in high school. Um, but the psychologist, but the psychiatrist, not psychologist, um, actually started a sexual relationship with Daniel. Um, and apparently that went on also for the last few years of his high school career. So kind of layering all of these issues together, you know, the people that were supposed to you're supposed to be able to trust to care for you and keep you safe are the ones who are completely not keeping you safe. In fact, the opposite, they're harming you. Um, as well as having no real social skills and, you know, inability to <laughs> excel in school. Um, he turned to a life of crime starting at a pretty young age. Um, when he was 15, he started with like burglary cases where he would break into people's homes and steal things, shoplift. Did I just do the same eye twice? I did. <laughs> that one will be very concealed, etc. cetera. Um, and then when he got into his later years, that kind of started escalating to doing like creepier things. So he would break into a house, steal things, but then also like move items around or leave things in the house and then leave the house basically as he found it, except the few things missing. Um, or moved or added to, uh, just kind of making it feel like a really creepy, violating vibe and that was his favorite part about it was playing the mind games with the people he was um invading their homes so this behavior continued until he was about 16. um at that point he somehow got a phone number to a family's home they're the andrews it's a father and two daughters um but he somehow got the phone number to their home um which he likely had already burgled and been inside of um, and he started to call the house and talk to the teenage daughters um, stating that a friend from school had given him their number so he would talk to the two daughters annie and jessica and just kind of get to know them um, he actually struck up more of a friendship with annie um, told her that he was like a good looking blonde you know athletic really popular guy at school um and so they would talk on the phone and eventually he asked her out on a date and of course she said yes but when he arrived he uh did not fit the description that he gave her he was like the original catfisher he was kind of like greasy and disheveled um he had dark hair which i mean doesn't matter but it's just you know not what he told her and so he wasn't this you know super attractive person that he uh, told her that he was and she was like totally surprised however annie uh for some reason decided to continue and went on the date they went to a local fair uh they were only there for about an hour before she was like um oh, good why don't you go ahead and take me home and while they were at the fair he they were you know of course talking as you do on dates and annie told him that her mother had died recently of cancer so it was just her 
her sister and her dad at home and she said he was like weirdly obsessed with her mom dying like he asked her how she felt at the moment her mom died like how she suffered just like she's like it was so creepy for just like a first date chit chat for this guy to be so obsessed with how my mom had died so a short while later as you know teenage girls who are probably a little bit grieved and just teenage girls are attempted to contact their mom through a seance which um you know who doesn't love a good Ouija board moment when they're 15 16 um and it seemed to them that they were pretty successful because that night and for the next few nights they heard knocking coming from their walls of their bedroom in at night so at first they thought it was you know their mom and they were kind of excited about it but then it would be going on every single night to the point where it was really almost disturbing. Um, and then things around the house started moving. Uh, they weren't in places that they left them. So the girls totally thought that they, during the seance, had you know welcomed somebody not good into their home, either like a ghost or a demon. So they were really, really scared. It got to the point where one night the girls were home alone while their dad was working and they'd heard like they were so used to hearing the knocking on walls but this night they heard it from the basement so they were home alone totally scared they grabbed a knife from the kitchen and went down to the basement and they said they saw written in blood on the walls the words i'm in your bedroom come and find me so they freaked out ran out of the house ran to the neighbor's house and the neighbor called their dad at work and you know he was frustrated because he's like you guys it's your imagination i understand you're grieving about your mom but you need to not with this stuff like just you're making it up it's all in your imagination but a few weeks later it happened again the girls were home alone they heard a knocking and they went up to annie's bedroom and they saw another message written on the wall that said i'm back find me if you can um so <laughs> clearly girls freaked out ran out of the house went over to the neighbors were just so the neighbor called their dad again because these girls were clearly terrified um and he was you know upset and irritated he came home and was like you guys need to stop i'm going to prove to you that there is nothing in this house um so he went in the house and he noticed that stuff was really you know disheveled and moved around more than um usual so then he went up to annie's bedroom to be like okay maybe stuff's a little weird but there's nothing written on the walls in blood um, so when he got up there, he actually found another message besides come find me that said marry me. And then he turned around and hiding behind the like door when it closes and opens, there's that little space. Hiding back there was someone dressed in his dead wife's clothes, wearing a blonde wig and wearing really bad makeup, holding a hatchet, and it was Daniel LaPlante. So there was a bit of a struggle, but um, Daniel was able to escape and like just completely not be able to be found it was like almost amazing how quickly he was able to get away with no trace after you know all this happened of course the police come out and they start investigating um they start searching the house for clues and find the most terrifying thing i've ever heard in my life there's a crawl space behind the walls of the girls um walls and so they're like, oh, what do we have here? Pop open however you, you know, access a crawl space. And back there, they find crouched and hidden Daniel LaPlante. It turns out he'd been living in the walls for quite a while. So he was taken and arrested and placed in a juvenile facility. So he was in juvenile detention for about a year. And once he was released, he went right back to, you know, his fancy ways of being a burglar and being a total creeper and just going around houses. And during one of these robberies, he actually took two handguns from one of the houses. On December 1st of 1987, he jumped a few phases in his escalation, but escalated pretty quickly when he broke into the home of the Gustafsons. They were about a mile away probably from where he was living. Um, and there was a woman, Priscilla, who was pregnant at the time and her two children were home. Her husband was working. After breaking into the home, he um, raped and shot Priscilla. Um, after she was dead, he drowned the two children. So that was so awful. Like, oh, I can't imagine coming home and finding your entire family gone like that. Um, but after the husband called the police, a manhunt was on for him and he wasn't found for a little while. Two towns over, 
Daniel LaPlante had broken into someone else's home, kidnapped <laughs> my kids downstairs, kidnapped the woman who lived there and you know made her take the car. She was able to escape. During the whole process, someone saw his picture on the news um, and called the authorities. So they were able to track it, track down the car. Um, the woman was safe and then they found him hiding in a dumpster because apparently dude loves to hide in small, weird, creepy spaces. So he was arrested and when the police arrested him, they found on one of his socks um, a hair from the little girl that had just drowned. So that was pretty concrete evidence and he was sentenced to three life sentences. That was in 1988, so he's been in prison since then. Um, has shown very little remorse, if not even none at all, for what he did. <clears throat> He's had some weird things go on while he was in prison, including trying to sue the prison system because he's a pra well, because he says he's a practicing Satanist. <laughs> and as that is his religion, he was not given the appropriate tools to perform satanic rites while in prison, among other just interesting behavioral things. Um, but by the time 2017 rolled around, he was pleading for a reduced sentence and said the following. I do not have words to fully express my profound sorrow, but I am truly sorry for the harm I have caused from every essence of who I am, from the depth of my soul, I am sorry. So is he actually sorry or does he know the right things to say to get a reduced sentence? However. How much are you gonna get reduced off of three life sentences, really? He was denied, so he's still gonna be in jail with no chance of parole for the rest of his life. The father, Andrew Gustafson, of that poor, poor family, died in 2014, so he did not get to hear that, you know, the final decision was that he'll be in jail forever. However, he did say this on his deathbed. Don't ever let him out, he should rot in prison. So he did kind of get his dying wish. And that is the very strange but very true story of the murderer Daniel LaPlante. What did you guys think of that one? Good crazy. I can't imagine those poor girls Annie and Jessica, well and their poor father, who probably if he wouldn't have come home those girls probably would have been chopped up with that hatchet. And can you imagine somebody with a hatchet wearing your dead mom's clothes in terrible drag coming at you in the middle of the night? No, thank you. All right, so that is it for me today. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button because there is a new Get Ready With Murder every single week. All right, have a super great rest of your day and we'll see you in the next one. Bye, 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 bye.